No era in the history of our country has attracted as much attention as the Wild West. The gunslinger, the shootout, the law and the lawless. This is mythology, American style. But as with most myths, it's hard to separate the hype from the history. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Universal Studios Hollywood! For most Americans, this is familiar ground. The landscape is larger than life. The tales taller than they are true. Towering over this potent brew of imagery stands one figure, the outlaw. For the last century, he's been riding a speeding locomotive straight into our imagination, and he's not a paying customer. Keep right on driving until I tell you to stop. What are you aiming to do, partner? I ain't aiming to do nothing. I'm doing it. The Western outlaw has been a media star since the 1870s. First through newspapers and books. Later through movies and television. In our eagerness to romanticize these legendary bad men, we've turned them into six shooting supermen. More saints than sinners. It comes with the territory. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The legend simply has more appeal than reality. A lot of it was the little guy against the big guy. They were all family men. Uh, they went out, uh, robbed banks, killed people, but then they came home to their families. They were celebrities in their day. Even the historians who study them offer a mixed saddlebag of theories on outlaw popularity. I think that picking a good name is an important part in an outlaw's career. Once the legend is created, you can't kill it with a bullet. A man you can kill, but the legend you can't. They're popular because they did exciting things and they were interesting personality. I think that dying's another good career move for an outlaw that wants to become a legend. <laughs> and our most legendary outlaws, Jesse James, Billy the Kid, Bell Star, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, owe their fame to that big old myth maker itself, the media. The outlaws that we know today and that we remember are really much more the product of fiction than they are of fact. Outlaw escapades, both real and imagined, were dramatized in newspapers and paperback books called dime novels. The West got wilder with each telling. If you're writing about a bumpkin, you can only write about him page and say, you know, he's a got straw in his hair and he, and he ambles around and he gets mad and he picks up a pitchfork and that's the end of it. But if you say he, he's the fastest gun in the West, he's got a lightning trigger to his, you know, he's got a temper that's right out at the edge here, he, that's, you've got a fascinating character. They were read by young people of all classes and they were particularly read by adults of uh, the working classes in the big cities. They were very often the first English books that uh, immigrants would learn to read. They're kind of a basic and pervasive literary medium on the analogy of television. The West was wild and people wanted to read about it. I mean, and the wilder you made it, <laughs> the more they read. In 1903, the Media Express switches to high gear with the success of Edwin Porter's The Great Train Robbery, marking the beginning of Hollywood's love affair with the West. Over 2,000 Westerns later, the romance continues. I think traditionally actors have thought that many times the bad guy, the outlaw, has got a flashier role. Maybe he doesn't have to be there the whole film, but he can come in and do his flash and leave a, an indelible memory. They were famous in their communities and uh, known as men that stood for what they believed in. I don't know why there's a reward for you and nothing for me. Maybe one of the reasons for the popularity of the outlaws is because they were, more often than not, champions of the people who were outcast from society. 
There's one who might not be surprised by all this admiration and myth-making. Meet the original spin doctor, Jesse James. Inspired outlaw faithful reenact his daring feats. January 31st, 1874. The notorious James Younger gang have just pulled off the first train robbery in the state of Missouri. Before escaping with the loot, Jesse hands over a colorful description of their bold crime, leaving a blank for the amount stolen. For this media-savvy outlaw, when legend becomes fact, print the press release. People come to St. Joseph, they've all heard of Jesse James, they want to see where he ended up, where his last uh, few hours occurred. And almost from the day he was killed, they have charged admission to go through and see the bullet hole and see where he died. And today, in the spirit of our founder, Jesse James, we still do that. We charge a dollar for adults and 50 cents for students to see the bullet hole. In Missouri, people take their native-born outlaw son very seriously. This is the original cabin area. Now, it's a very luxury cabin. It contains two rooms. There is a certain segment of the James lore that probably wishes that he didn't die. There's very similar comparisons to Jesse and actually Elvis. Graceland it's not, but Jesse seekers come from all over the world to be closer to their outlaw king. They want to know, is he a good guy or a bad guy? And I sense that most people want him to be a good guy. I know I do, personally. I want to think he's a good guy. I think I can defend everything that he did. This urge to defend Jesse James is the basis for his outlaw myth. He's always inspired an us-against-them kind of mentality. The myth is rooted in the bloody history of Clay County, Missouri. When Jesse was growing up, it was North against South. It was neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother. Well, Clay County was an occupied county during that time. The majority of uh, the people were pro-Southern. They were slaveholders. The James family arrived in Clay County from Kentucky with seven slaves that they owned. The slave cabin is just uh, to my left. We don't tend to think of Jesse James as part of the slave-holding South, although his family did own slaves. We don't associate the violence of Jesse James with the violence of the Ku Klux Klan, though the James gang and the Klan develop their tactics of terrorism at about the same time and are operating at the same time. At 14, a brutal confrontation with Yankee troops stoked the flames of rebellion in Jesse's young heart. They were seeking his brother Frank, who had joined Quantrill's guerrilla fighters. He was whipped with bull whips, uh, brutally beaten. The story says that Jesse was able to crawl back to the house here, and upon his return to home, he found his stepfather hanging from a tree. They hung him three times, not killing him, and it gave him a severe speech impairment and severe brain damage. And Jesse came back and told his mother that he would start getting revenge back on this, those men for the rest of his life, and that's what started Jesse's hatred towards people. Jesse, barely 16, began fighting with a group of Confederate irregulars, the Bushwhackers, led by Bloody Bill Anderson. Bloody Bill Anderson's command was probably the most ruthless command in, in the state of Missouri. These guys were known for scalping, cutting throats, a lot of mutilations towards Union prisoners and, and dead as such. Didn't show a lot of respect for, for Yankees. After the collapse of the Confederacy, the James boys returned home hoping to pick up the pieces. People like Frank and Jesse James, William Quantrill, the survivors of the guerrilla fighters, were not allowed to take the oath. They were outlawed. They were treated, in effect, as war criminals. They were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to own property. They uh, were not even allowed to borrow money from a federal bank. Jesse and Frank, along with fellow bushwhacker Cole Younger, decided to put their guerrilla warfare tactics to good use. It was payback time. And so one day he just said to Frank, hey, look, we're being hunted all the time for crimes we didn't do. What the heck, why don't we do one? So they robbed a bank, the first one in history. He used his experiences in the Civil War as a kind of a bitter way of getting even with people. And today we have that same thing happen. They call it post-traumatic stress. I'm Jesse James, my brother Frank, Bob Younger, Chad Well. There's a lesson for you, Bob. No one should be able to identify a guerrilla in enemy country. Besides, he's a Yankee. Jesse's crimes became heroic deeds in the hands of John Newman Edwards, 
editor for the Kansas City Times. He himself had been an officer under the famous uh, Texas General Joe Shelby. Uh, he wanted to emphasize the chivalry and gallantry of the Old South and of the Confederate cause. He used uh, the James Gang to represent those still fighting for that lost cause. And he greatly uh, embellished and romanticized the James Boys. Edwards created a romantic image of Jesse the national media could exploit. The technology for mass production and mass distribution of printed material had really become quite modern and quite advanced. Cheap magazines, dime novels, nickel novels, just a vast explosion of these popular forms. And the writers for these, the companies that produce these, are hungry for material. There was a relationship between the media and the outlaws by which each fed on each other. And certainly the outlaw understood the fame to be derived from a good rapport with the press. He became the Wild West equivalent of the superhero. The national media made him into a Robin Hood figure on a much larger scale than Jesse himself ever imagined being. The late 1800s were a time of great public corruption and social injustice. As a fictional hero, Jesse James could strike out at unregulated banks and railroads, two of the most despised institutions of the period. The railroads were very threatened by Frank and Jesse. People were afraid to ride the trains through this area. People were afraid to send shipments of money. So the, the railroads in turn hired the Pinkerton detectives to track down Frank and Jesse. The Pinkerton Detective Agency was the equivalent of a FBI. When they were involved in a case, it often attracted a great deal of notoriety. But one night in January in 1876, they wound up getting the wrong kind of notoriety when trying to track down the James brothers. Jesse's stepbrother was killed in the explosion and his mother lost an arm. A nationwide cry of sympathy went out for the James boys. The fallacy is just a couple of dumb farm boys. And that's uh, where the Pinkertons made their mistake, thinking they were a couple of dumb farm boys, and that's why they always outwitted the Pinkertons. By outlaw standards, Jesse had a long career. For over 10 years, the best in the business was the terror of train engineers and bank tellers throughout the Midwest. He had a good cover, you know, the people in his part of the country looked out for him, and I think a lot of his friends and neighbors were afraid of him. They knew if they said something about him, they probably wouldn't live very long. But he didn't have that protection in the North. But in 1876, the James Younger gang tempted fate a bit too far north of the Mason-Dixon line. The Northfield raid totally disrupted Jesse's life and his gang. And the Youngers were captured and put in prison. And he never was able to get a group together again that amounted to anything. And Jesse never recovered from Northfield. By the time he ended up recruiting Bob and Charlie Ford, obviously Bob, uh, uh, you know, Bob was not the right person to recruit and shot him in the back. I really like this old sample. Is that straight? I shot Jesse James. On April 3rd, 1882, it was a warm morning. Uh, Jesse was in the front room of the house. Uh, he noticed a picture was hanging crooked. Uh, some people say he was dusting it. He took off his guns for the first time and climbed on a chair. And Bob and Charlie Ford drew their guns, and Bob fired, and Jesse was shot behind his right ear. The bullet went out above his left eye and into the wall, and Jesse fell dead in the floor. This marked the end of America's Robin Hood. This is where Jesse was originally buried up until 1902. It's not hard to see where Jesse got his flair for self-promotion. His mother, one week after her beloved son's death, was conducting tours of the house, telling visitors how he was brutalized by the establishment. There were pebbles on the grave, and she would sell the pebbles to different tourists, so they would take a piece of Jesse home with them. And after a while, the grave pebbles would begin to diminish. She would send some of the young children down to the creek bed and gather more pebbles and then replenish the grave. Mrs. Samuels needn't have worried about keeping her son's legend alive. Jesse was reborn into the 20th century, thanks to 43 separate feature films. Oh, Jesse! Jesse's granddaughter wrote a manuscript telling his true story. The 1939 film, Jesse James, directed by Henry King, was inspired by this unpublished work. 
King did a lot of research for the film and then, as he himself admitted, used hardly any of it. What it stimulated him to think about was the idea of creating, creating a myth. And it's in this, at this very moment, that King creates his legend of a populist hero. My mother was asked by the press at the time of the premiere uh, whether it was true or not. And she said, uh, well, Jesse and Frank James were real people. And oh yeah, they did ride horses. And that was the full truth of that entire movie. And of course, Hollywood's concept of Jesse James is sort of dashing. And the more we could find out about Jesse, the more the conclusion that we came to was that he was kind of a pathological character. It's not only Hollywood that carries on the legacy. Today, in true outlaw paradox, one town celebrates Jesse's defeat. However, there's Jesse when he was 20. Ways less than Another preserves the legend. We're gonna have this little dance here. Let's make him dance. And still others have fun with it. Even now, Jesse has defenders and accusers. If Jesse were convicted by a jury, uh, and I were the sentencing judge, I think I would have to uh, sentence him either to death or to life in prison without possibility of parole because he killed people. It's that simple. What would you do if you were shot while carrying a white flag? What would you do if your stepfather was hung? What would you do if your mother who was pregnant was abused by the Union soldiers and she ended up miscarrying that child? What would you do if your farm was blown up? What would you do? What would you do if you couldn't be a minister? What would you do if you couldn't teach? Maybe we might do some things that Jesse did. Local newspapers printed this drawing of Jesse. He's risen out of history to become a permanent fixture on the frontier landscape. Jesse James, the original outlaw. Well, I'll tell you a story of Billy the Kid, and I'll tell you some dastardly deeds that he did way out in New Mexico, long, long ago, when a man's only chance was his own 44. This is Billy the Kid's official gravesite, located in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, the heart of Billy country. The wire cage is to protect his tombstone from overzealous souvenir hunters. An ironic image for a young man who broke out of nearly every jail he was tossed into. Billy is our most slippery outlaw. As a historical figure, he didn't leave a good paper trail behind. No apparent birth records, or no birth records that historians have generally accepted. Uh, argument about the circumstances, at least, of the death. Even his official gravesite is in question. Some believe his true resting place to be outside Santa Fe, beneath U.S. Highway 285. And so his peace is disturbed by all of us tourists driving back and forth over his bones. But nobody knows it. I suspect they would be out there digging up the pavement. He may be right. Billy's big business. Just about everybody wants a piece of this boy bandit king. There have been uh, Billy the Kid dime novels, films about Billy the Kid, a ballet about Billy the Kid. There have been several melodramas, both on radio and stage type productions, uh, produced about Billy the Kid. And uh, there's a line of children's clothes called Billy the Kid. From ballet to bib overalls, Billy as media icon cuts a wide path through our popular culture. But it's up on the silver screen where his outlaw star truly shines. There have been, after all, 48 movies made about Billy the Kid, more than any other character in Western history. And then it goes on, you know, they got Billy the Kid from Texas. They got Billy the Kid from here. Billy the Kid does this. It went on and on and on. Well, you've done me a good turn. <laughs> oh, that's all right, mister. Killing rats comes natural to me. In the 20th century, Billy has become America's favorite outlaw. He did this, I suppose, because there are so many unanswered questions. 
Billy's whole life is one big question mark, starting with his place of birth. Most agree it was the wild and lawless frontier town of New York City. In 1859, Billy came into the world as Henry McCarty in the Irish slums of Lower Manhattan, right where the imposing twin towers of the World Trade Center now stand. His dad died at a very young age. Uh, his mother remarried, then his mother died. And as a young teenage boy, he was out on the streets of Silver City and other mining camps of uh, Colorado and New Mexico. He was the ultimate underdog, the teenager cast adrift on the streets. Way out in the West with a gun in his hand at the age of 12 years, he did kill his first man. He was an old Silver City as a very young lad when poor Billy went to the bad. The traditional ballad says he killed a man, his first man, at age 12. Well, again, not so. Actually, what he was involved in was much less poetic. Uh, he was involved in stealing some butter and ultimately some clothes from Chinese laundrymen. Stealing laundry? Hardly the stuff of legend. Can this be the vicious outlaw credited with killing 21 men? Apparently not. In his young and brief career, Billy the Kid was responsible for the deaths of at least six men. He probably had killed at least one man in Arizona. He killed four men, for sure. I choose to believe that he might have killed four, maybe. With Billy, everyone can have an opinion. That's what makes him so attractive. Defending the underdog doesn't hurt either. Billy came in uh, and loved the land and got to know the Spanish people, learned the language. My grandfather, when they'd ask him how come that Billy had more Mexican friends than he did Anglos, he said, because us Mexicans think more of a friend than we do of money. Part of the legend of Billy the Kid is that, of course, he was a social bandit fighting on the side of the oppressed Hispanics and the poor against the big cattle ranchers of New Mexico. The 1870s in New Mexico were a time of great economic and political upheaval. Cattle ranchers vied for territory and government contracts. One side murdered John Tunstall, Billy's employer and mentor. In avenging Tunstall's death, Billy was sucked into legend and played out his part in the Lincoln County War. One of the great range wars of all time for control of a large portion of eastern New Mexico between a ranching faction led by John Tunstall and Alex McSween and an urban faction led by the Murphy Dolan bunch. And here, most prominent in all those fights was this young lad of 19, 20, 21 years old, Billy the Kid. Personally, I feel like that he was a uh, young man caught up in an older man's war and, uh, I, as I would say, a kid fighting in a grown man's world. After the war, Billy was charged with the killing of Sheriff Brady of Lincoln County, the only man charged with any crime resulting from the Lincoln County War. He was sentenced to death for the murder of Sheriff William Brady. He was one of six people who shot the sheriff down. The other five all were pardoned. In Billy the Kid's case, uh, the newspapers in New Mexico were uh, quite uh, interested in, in all the acts of violence and depredation taking place in New Mexico territory. These folks did their deeds, the deeds flowed back to the east, they became magnified, then the people themselves began to live up to their image of themselves. It became a media creation. Uh, most people would admit it became a scapegoat. It became the focus of really the ruling groups in New Mexico and became the representation for them, the embodiment of evil. New Mexico was vying for statehood. A high-profile outlaw like Billy the Kid was a liability. He would have to go. Don't do it, Bill. Oh, come on, don't do it, I ain't kidding. The legend can be said to have begun when the kid escaped for the last time on April 28, 1881, shooting his two guards here in Lincoln. The deputy sheriffs who were killed were not angels themselves, apparently. So it became a sort of a Robin Hood escapes from King John's castle. Sort of thing. When he rode out of here, he rode into legend. Legend was waiting for Billy in the form of Pat Garrett, who, ironically, is the one most responsible for launching the kid's outlaw myth. Pat Garrett honored Billy with the classic outlaw send-off. 
Inez. Assassination. Billy the Kid, just 21 years of age, was dead. Say I killed Billy the Kid. There's nothing more. He and Pat were good friends when Pat first came here. And then when Pat was appointed territorial deputy sheriff, granddaddy said he walked up to Pat and told him, he said, Pat said, I know you'll have a job to do. He said, but one favor I'm going to ask of you. He said, don't shoot me in the back. And Billy turned around and got on his horse and rode off. He didn't shoot him in the back, but he might as well. Well, I'll tell you how Billy the Kid met his fate. The bright moon was shining and the hour was late, shot down by Pat Garrett, who once was his friend. The outlaw's life has now come to an end. After ending the kid's short life, Pat Garrett published a book, hoping to spin public favor in his direction. Well, this miserable book was an enormous failure. In fact, most of the copies were burned or thrown away. But nevertheless, those that survived helped to influence generations of writers to come helped to create the legend of Billy the Kid. Because if Garrett was to derive a reputation as the greatest lawman in the West, he of course had to track down and kill the greatest outlaw. But it backfired on him because legend came to view Garrett as the villain of the piece and the kid as the hero. I'll sing you a song of Billy the Kid. I'll sing of those desperate days that he did. Out here in New Mexico long, long ago, when a man's only chance... Once every year, Lincoln, New Mexico welcomes thousands of Billy's biggest fans to celebrate their favorite outlaw. There are legends that this is not his last escape, that he lived to be an old man. And one, one fellow told me over here that, that the kid, as an old man, came to see the first pageant, and he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> And in Lincoln, it's not just the pageant that draws the crowd. You'd be amazed how many people just want to see this. Just want to see the bullet hole. What that means to some people, I have no idea, but uh, it's a calling card. The films, the books, and the pageants pretend to give us the real Billy the Kid. They only add to the legend. What's left are a few written documents, some bullet holes, and this. A tintype photograph. It's the only verified picture of this elusive outlaw. We tend to think we can judge a person by looking at him. And so certainly we do come to judgments on the basis of the looks. And yet all the other informative paths to him are not enough to settle the question, who, who was this man? There he is, he's standing there in front of you, you're looking at him, but uh, it's still a mystery. Now there's many a young man who started life with a chance to go square. But just like Billy, they went astray. They'll lose their life in the very same way. Right now we want to get this bank for a stake before it moves. We've been watching. Everybody's closing out their accounts. Chuck full of cash. Wait a minute. You said we. That's right. Any objections? Yeah. Busting banks is men's work. Bell Star did all right. Bell Star did not do it all right. Never before has an outlaw been so completely reinvented by the media. She was no desperado. She wasn't. She wasn't the queen of the desperados. Bell was portrayed as glamorous, romantic, and dangerous. All the ingredients of a real Western legend. When we talk about women in the West, we put this aura of glamour over it, and somehow it comes over as being a romantic way to live. I don't think Western life was really ever very romantic for any women in the 19th century. It may not have been romantic, and it certainly wasn't glamorous, but the rough and tumble frontier life of Bell Star was anything but boring. Bell Star was Myra Maybell Shirley. She was born in Carthage, Missouri in 1847, and uh, she was the daughter of John and Elizabeth Shirley. 
a very well-to-do old Southern Kentucky family. She went to a female academy. She was very accomplished, played the piano, well-educated. But then the Civil War broke out, and the town was thrown into chaos because of Union guerrilla raids and Confederate guerrilla raids. There were very turbulent times. Her home in Carthage was burned to the ground, and her family was forced to flee into Texas. And she grew up a very strong Confederate sympathizer. Her father's friends were the Jameses and the Daltons and the Youngers, and those were the people that she grew up around. Her father opened up a hotel and a saloon, which became a popular watering hole for ex-Confederate guerrillas. Young Belle's eyes were opened to the adventurous world of the outlaw. Her first husband, Jim Reed, had killed two men in Evansville, Arkansas, and they had a $5,000 reward out for his arrest. He was ran down and killed by a bounty hunter in 1875, I think it was. Then she married Sam Starr. Sam Starr was a Cherokee, a friend of Jim Reed's and an outlaw himself. He plied his trade as a horse thief while Bell played piano in a Dallas saloon. She was very exceptional that she spoke her mind and did what she pleased at a time when women weren't supposed to do that. She's no mammy-pammy person. I mean, hell, she's a rough, tough old gal. I mean, she was on the frontier, and, you know, she knew how to take care of herself, and she did. When stolen horses were found in Sam Starr's possession, Belle, along with her husband, paid the consequences. She spent six months in the Detroit State Penitentiary. Belle Starr's no outlaw. Bell Starr challenges our notions of the West and of manliness and manhood in the West. And I think that could be frightening. In 1889, shortly after visiting a friend, Bell was shot from her horse by an unknown assailant. And in true outlaw fashion, it was her untimely death that triggered the media's interest in her life. Well, nobody even knew her until the New York Times published a little paragraph or two of her death, and they called her a notorious outlaw woman and so forth. By the time Belle Starr died, Americans were already worrying that the great Western adventure was coming to a close. There were people who really wanted to preserve the spirit of the American West. So it's not surprising that her obituary would use a term like a desperate woman. So it fit very well into what people in the East wanted to read about the West. The legend of Belle is what sold newspapers. And dime novel publisher Richard Fox turned up the heat with a female version of the outlaw formula. He used a technique in the case of many, many outlaws. He would just make up the facts surrounding these few actual truths and transform it into a very hyped up story to be sold in dime novels at newsstands and on trains and so forth. The universe has produced none more remarkable than Bella Starr, the bandit queen. She was more amorous than Anthony's mistress, more relentless than Pharaoh's daughter, and braver than Joan of Arc. Hey, what junk? In 1941, Hollywood joined in the fun, starting with the glamorous Jean Tierney. Others soon followed. Well, I'm not going to hide out. The law's not going to make me run from hole to hole like a rat. And they're not going to try me for any killing I didn't do. They made uh, the son of Belle Star. And then they made Belle Star's daughter. And they Belle starred her to death. I just want to find out what it feels like to be respectable. For a while, anyway. You'll never be respectable, Belle. You're a whore. Beyond Hollywood, Bell's life continues to draw a crowd. Outlaw aficionados gather to review a reenactment of her life. At about the same time, I was your congressman. The government that you work for burned my hometown of Carthage to the ground. Bell's daughter, Pearl, foresaw the enduring legacy of her scrappy mother. She had this engraved on her tombstone. Shed not for her the bitter tear nor give the heart to vain regrets. Tis but the casket that lies here. The gem that filled it sparkles yet. I'm the outlaw trail. I span this great western land from the blue Canadian Rockies to the muddy Rio Grande. Many an outlaw has treading my course and many a lawman as well. And many have lost their lives along my way. There's stories I'll never tell.
Out here in the slick rock, the steep canyons, and high desert of southern Utah lies the Outlaw Trail. It was on this network of hidden passageways that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid would lose the posses and lawmen assigned to bring them in. Nobody ever caught them. This unforgiving landscape almost hid them too well. The last of our Western bandits were in danger of fading into history until introduced to an outlaw's best friend, Hollywood. I'll jump first. No. Nope. Then you jump first. No, I said. What's the matter with you? I can't swim. Why, are you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. In 1969, when Paul Newman and Robert Redford teamed up in the hit movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the outlaw legend of Butch and Sundance took a giant leap into immortality. The movie of, of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid takes a pair of outlaws who were not anywhere near Jesse James' class in terms of their fame in the 19th century and really makes them figures of great stature and significance. Who are those guys? The movie also had a big effect on the folks who live around the outlaws' old stomping grounds. 10 or 15 years ago, if you had an outlaw in your family, you covered him up. I mean, you buried him. You put him in the closet. But today, if there's an outlaw in your family, you get that guy out and you brag about him. Say, hey, my great uncle or my great grandfather ran with Butch Cassidy or so, so on and so forth. William L. Simpson, who was my grandfather, was selected as a special prosecutor to prosecute Cassidy. He was then sent to the territorial prison. And he said, Billy, you got to let me out tonight. This is Cassidy saying this to my grandfather. I have business tonight that I can't tell you what it is, but I'll be back in this jail by 8 o'clock in the morning. And my grandfather said, uh, I believe you. I'll trust you. And he went. Butch Cassidy was known as a leader of a loosely knit group of outlaws called the Wild Bunch. Their activities began at the end of the outlaw era. In the 1890s, the Outlaw Trail was crucial to their survival. It was the last remnants of the American frontier. They were bandits and outlaws of the Intermountain West, the high mountains and the Rocky Mountain areas, both north and south, and the whole chain in Utah and the canyon countries. And most of their robberies took place between little towns along the Union Pacific Railroad. If you look at the Outlaw Trail, they really traveled all the way from Canada to Mexico over a period of time with lots of side trails. But distance didn't seem to bother them at all. The Outlaw Trail had roots in early history. What we have here is a picture rock or petroglyphs that the Indians many, many, many years ago, back probably in Anasazi time, chiseled into the rock. This is depicting a switchback trail that goes up a mountain. When it gets to the top of the mountain, there's a spring of water there. It shows a spring. This is actually an Indian map. By reading this, if they could tell where to follow this, and find water. This little bitty spring here would produce, say, a quart of water every minute, which is a gallon every four or five minutes, so that's three or four hundred gallons a day. In order to get a drink of water here, all we have to do is just uh, scoop the mud away and make us a little puddle, and then the spring fills the puddle. And you can, if you want to fill your canteen, you can use your coffee cup to just dip out of there. But if you just stopped here to get you a drink in the afternoon, you just make your puddle and bend down and drink out of it. The gang had a number of colorfully named hideouts placed along the outlaw trail. Hole in the Wall, Robber's Roost, and Brown's Hole were just a few. I go down through old Montana and Wyoming on the way, where the Hole in the Wall outlaw gang oftentimes did stay. I've seen Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch in Brown's Hole with all their take, and I've had them winter in Robber's Roost, waiting for spring to break. The Robber's Roost area is actually an area between the Dirty Devil and the Green Rivers in southeastern Utah. And its boundaries are these high slick rock canyons that you see in the background. So to get into this country, it's necessary for you to come down into the canyons and then climb up onto this mesa country. It made it a natural for the outlaws simply because if the posse tried to follow them, the posse was a total disadvantage because they didn't know which rock the outlaws might be hiding behind. And so the outlaws could hide and ambush the posse at any point. The Wild Bunch was a model of efficiency when it came to planning their capers. And when they uh, robbed uh, Cascade Payroll, 25 miles out, they had a 15-year-old kid with two horses. And when they got there, they changed horses and went right on into Robber's Roost. And the posse never even got close to them. So they were kind of like the 
criminal Pony Express, they would go and get a fresh horse and jump on it and be gone. Fresh horses were one part of the equation. Local ranchers were the other. As you can see, there's a fairly good road down here, but in 1890, the trail was mighty dim because Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch was about the only ones that was allowed to use it. It's said that Charlie Krause kept a man posted up here so that nobody would come down into Browns Park that they didn't know about. Rancher Charlie Krause was just one of the many who harbored Butch and Sundance. Butch and Sundance did not have reputations for great violence. They were not viewed as killers and murderers as Jesse James and Billy the Kid were. Try for the two on the right. Can you take the two on the right? Kid, there's something I think I ought to tell you. I never shot anybody before. The 1969 movie ensured their fame and romanticized their lifestyle. One hell of a time to tell me. But life on the outlaw trail was anything but desirable. That's what's left of the cabin that Butch Cassidy and, and uh, those guys stayed in and gambled in and, and stopped over in. Butch Cassidy and those guys had no permanent home. They had one hell of a life. When they wasn't on the run, they had a pack horse with a little bit of beans and bacon and a little bit of jerky and canteen of water and a bottle of moonshine. And they traveled mighty light with a, the light bedroll. So I'll wager that we wouldn't want to have been in their shoes hardly any time. If you look at the number of years that they operated, which runs roughly from the uh, late 1880s into the 20th century, there weren't that many robberies. They were pretty well spread out. They were cowboys. They spent a lot of time being cowboys. They also found time to pursue other interests. Butch was quite a ladies' man, especially in the Browns whole country. One lady that has been amorously linked to both Butch and Sundance is a woman named Etta Place. And it seems that Etta was in several places at the same time. I've had, I think, uh, less success in trying to find out who she actually was and, and what happened to her than anyone else. The Sundance Kid's son said that she was a sister to his mother. She was one of uh, Sundance's girlfriends. Another researcher claims that she was a lady of the evening in Texas. The woman in Butch and Sundance's life seems determined to remain a mystery. A lot of the ladies used the name Etta Place to fool the Pinkertons. They would change identities so that when they were Pinkertons were getting too close, why, they'd try to fool them. All the women of the outlaws were friends with each other, and they traded places with each other all the time. I mean, these are wild women we're talking about and wild men. <laughs> Butch and Sundance were heroic figures to many in the local area. Guys like Butch and Sundance were willing to take on the Union Pacific Railroad. That's a big thing, and the railroads had big land grants and uh, in many cases were hurting the small farmers. E.H. Harriman, the owner of the Union Pacific Railroad, formed a super posse to wipe out the Wild Bunch. The best trackers and marksmen in the West were given their own train and put on 24-hour call. A kind of outlaw SWAT team. Who are those guys? By 1901, the law was getting much better organized. I think Butch and Sundance saw the handwriting on the wall. Their next move was to head south, as in South America. In 1902, they traveled down to Argentina, ostensibly to get in the ranching business. The movie has Butch and Sundance meeting their demise in a shootout in Bolivia. This is just one theory. We don't believe that they was ever killed in South America. Ann Bassett, she claims she's seen them after that. The story is that Butch uh, died in um, the Northwest. The family got a letter saying they buried him with a Christian funeral. If you want to really pin me down, I'll say that uh, Butch died in, uh, down in Nye County, Nevada, uh, about 1944. And I believe a Sundance kid died under another name in the Utah State Prison in uh, June of 1955. It doesn't really matter where or when they died. Butch and Sundance marked the end of an era. The frontier that produced them was gone, and it took the outlaws with it. If Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kids still ride, they do it as outlaws of the imagination. What happened to the old bank? It was beautiful. People kept robbing it. Small price to pay for beauty. Ah, 
I am a living legend. This I zealously claim. I'm part of this great western land. Never forget my fame. Well, who do you think Billy Kidd was? Good guy or bad guy? Mm, a little bit of both. The outlaw's legacy is a double-edged sword. He stands at the crossroads of good and evil, a hero to some, a villain to others. The outlaw is a person who stands on the border of what is permissible to the individual. How far can an individual go in a quest for personal vindication or personal justice? How far can they go in resisting the law uh, in the name of some personal idea of right? We've been staring down the barrel of the outlaw's gun for over a hundred years now. Our search for its modern-day relevance is as powerful as ever. We've lost a sense of ourselves, a sense of national identity. We don't have it in terms of faith. We don't have it in terms of politics. We don't have it in terms of business. We've sort of exhausted materialism, and we're looking around for heroes, things to believe in. Where legend meets fact, that's outlaw territory. He staked out a claim on our national character and wanders the frontier of our imagination. The facts won't ever change, but the legends will grow forever. We admire people like Jesse James because they represent, or they've come to represent, the struggle of the little guy against the great corporation, uh, the great powers in the land. And I always think in this connection of a, of a Woody Guthrie song, and there's a verse in it that goes, as through this world I've traveled, I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. But as through this world you travel and as through this world you roam, you won't never see an outlaw drive a family from their home. The outlaw had their part, and they, it, although it only lasted about less than 50 years, it was an era, it was an outlaw era, and I, I'm glad we have it. The sting of hot southern whips forced slaves into the wilderness. With only fear to live on and freedom to dream of, they helped create the American West. History has forgotten to include many who made a difference. The early frontier was a melting pot. Black, red, and white the hunted, the hunter, the pain, courageous women, and the unique American symbol, the cowboy. Together they challenged the frontier. This child grew up believing that all cowboys were white. His heroes were big western stars like Tom Mix. He didn't know that a black cowhand hand named Williams taught a New York tenderfoot named Theodore Roosevelt how to break a horse. Or that a black cowpuncher named Clay 
taught the cowboy movie star Will Rogers his first rope tricks. He would have been surprised to know that one of the greatest cowboys ever was Bill Pickett. Black children only knew the matinee idols from Hollywood. Buck Jones, Tim McCoy, and Gene Autry. But who were the black heroes? Hollywood shaped the image of the American cowboy. Judge, I've come to ask you to release our funds from the bank. But they didn't know what to do with the black cowboy. Even John Wayne in blackface wound up on the cutting room floor. To Hollywood, the black man was a joke. Yet black westerns were made for black audiences. Herb Jeffries, the singing cowboy, starred in many of these early films. We were playing in the, an engagement in Cleveland, Ohio, and back in 1934. And there was a little black child uh, trailing down the alley behind a bunch of white children, and he was crying. So the orchestra out taking a break during the dance period uh, saw him crying, and they hollered at him. and said, what's the matter? Those boys hit you? He said, no, they're my friends. He said, uh, why are you crying? He said, well, we're playing cowboys, and they won't let me play with them. So they asked him, why? He said, well, I want to be Tom Mix, and they won't let me be Tom Mix because Tom Mix is not black. And uh, that struck me uh, very deeply. And I said, well, maybe I should go out to Hollywood and try to find somebody to make some black cowboy pictures. With my ropes and my saddle and my horse and my gun, I'm a happy cowboy. I'm riding with the captain, I'm always on the run. There's only one shot left. First all-black cast cowboy picture, full-length feature, singing cowboy ever made on planet Earth, we made it, called Harlem on the Prairie. That was the first black cowboy picture. Then we made some others after that. It went so well, we made uh, another one called Harlem Rides the Range. Then that went so well, they made one called Harlem, Two-Gun Man from Harlem. And I got tired of the Harlem. I said, listen, can't we call these pictures something else? So the, the, the fourth one was called The Bronze Buckaloo. That was my favorite. Come on, smoke up. Oh. What's the big idea, fella? You didn't have that gun, I'd show you. Of uh, course, we needed these pictures, and we need, we need pictures today to explain the circumstances. Broadway, 1993. The film Posse brings an authentic black western to the American screen, 55 years after Jeffries took Harlem West. a very positive part of America with the settlement of California and all of that, the gold rush and everything. We weren't just slaves, we built this country. It's fun to go back to the Wild Wild West well, and let people know that the Wild Wild West was tamed by Americans of all colors. Not just what you've seen, don't believe the hype. Because we were all there. It's the first film that has historical accuracy uh, about black cowboys that existed that many Americans, certainly African Americans, white Americans, do not know about. The contribution has been absolutely opaque, deleted, and even our young ones haven't seen the real black cowboys. In order to tell the story of the black cowboy, we have to go back to the earliest days of the Western frontier. From the beginning, African Americans were big players. 
In 1803, Thomas Jefferson opened the West with the Louisiana Purchase. Lewis and Clark explored the Western Territory, but a black slave named York and a Shoshone Indian named Sacagawea scouted the territory. The Louisiana Purchase ran from the Mississippi to the Pacific. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark led an expedition of 43 men and one woman to do the impossible. Cross the Rocky Mountains on horseback, boat down the Columbia River to the Pacific Ocean, and live to tell about it. The Indians weren't with the plan. This tiny group of pale-faced intruders was in for it. Until York, Clark's personal slave stepped forward. York blew their minds. They'd never seen a black man before. Clark noted in his diary, All flocked around him and examined him from top to toe. I ordered my black servant to dance, which amused the crowd very much. A Mandan chief spit on his hands and began to rub. The black didn't rub off. York's act saved the mission. He also started an American tradition, the first black superstar on tour. Lewis and Clark had their meal ticket. As they worked the Louisiana Territory, they featured York, who scouted by day and danced by night. The expedition stayed on the road for four years. They were the first party to reach the Pacific by the Northern Overland Route. Lewis and Clark did right by York. At the end of the expedition, following a simple ceremony, Clark gave York his freedom. From the mid-18th century, black people beat slavery by running west. This wide view of the frontier lured a wealthy, free young black man searching for his fortune. Jean-Baptiste de Saab used his friendship with a Native American named Choctaw to make his lasting mark on the opening of the frontier. De Saab was born in Haiti to a French pirate and an African slave. After completing his studies in Paris, his father rewarded him with his own ship. The Saab set sail for America in 1765. Shipwrecked off the coast of Louisiana, he was taken to New Orleans where his freedom was in danger. Afraid of being sold into slavery, he had to get out of the South. He went into hiding until he met Choctaw, a Panatami Indian who turned him on to the frontier. Beautiful rich land, no slaves, no masters. De Saab became a fur trapper and won the respect of the Native Americans. They trusted him. They invited him to join their nation. While carrying an Indian chief's plea for peace to a warring tribe, Jean passed through an area off the tip of Lake Michigan where great blasts of heat were followed by icy bolts of wind. As Chicago, the place of bad smells, was the name the Indians gave this foul plot of land. But De Staub was a visionary. He sensed something special. He believed this could be a gateway to the Mississippi Valley, a crossroads of travel that was to serve the development of the West. De Saab drained these putrid swamps with his bare hands. The Shun territory became one of the majestic American cities. Jean-Baptiste de Saab is the father of Chicago. In the South, black pioneers fled plantations, risking fear of the unknown against the hell of Southern slavery. Oh, my God. 
Hatred and fear forced their hand. The only antidote for slavery was escape. They covered themselves with onion juice to throw off the hounds. They had to endure the breakup of their families. Thousands of slaves made the choice, knowing they would never see their loved ones again. Liberty, slaves gold. The flight for freedom was on. The odds weren't good because they had to outrun a way of life that viewed them as valuable property. In the early 1800s, thousands of runaway slaves went south across the American border into free Spanish Florida and hid in swamps. Tired and desperate, many found a home with the Seminole Indians. Black and red, the initial bond was skin color. They would trade with each other, intermarry, and fight a common enemy. I think one of the reasons why the Indians uh, liked uh, the blacks so well is because they could relate to them, you know, knowing that they were treated so brutally and so badly. The Indians themselves knew about this, and they thought, well, if they were ever captured or anybody ever got them, they would be turned into slaves just as well. Like, as a matter of fact, if you go back to Africa, you'll see that the Africans, uh, they uh, used arrows and bows. Uh, the, the Africans also uh, uh, used feathers in their dances, they had medicine men, they had witch doctors, just exactly like the Indian. So uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, we know that the Seminoles took in tremendous amount of uh, black slaves who had escaped. As a matter of fact, the, uh, some of the uh, Indians even called the Seminoles the black tribes. The Florida Seminoles and Africans formed a strong bond. It was destroyed in three bloody wars. The U.S. Army mounted a massive slave catching mission in Florida. The Seminoles fought the U.S. Army to protect the freedom of their African brothers and sisters who lived among them. The Seminole Wars would cost $20 million and the lives of 1,500 U.S. soldiers before the Seminole African resistance was broken. In the early frontier, the tenuous relationship between runaway slaves and Native Americans was a recurring theme. Jim Beckwith, famed mountain man, was one of the most daring individuals in pre-Civil War America. He manhandled the untamed West. The Jim Beckwith, as we well know, became one of the great scouts of all times, was able to get wagon trains through. He spoke many uh, in Indian nations, and he could deal with the Indians and get the wagon trains through. Born a slave, he traveled to St. Louis with his master, who was also his father. He escaped and lived with the Crow Indians. He became a chief called Morning Star. Beckworth loved to fight. On the battlefield, he was known as Bloody Arm. But leading the Crows into battle wasn't enough. In an act of betrayal, he left the Crows and hired on to kill his Indian brothers for the U.S. Army. One of a growing number of African Americans who attacked Native Americans for profit. He later became a valuable scout on many expeditions throughout the West. Beckworth discovered a trail through the Sierra Nevadas 
which still bears his name. As Jim Beckworth became an American folk hero, his color was being drained from his image. His features were anglicized for public consumption. By the following century, when Hollywood found the famed mountain man, he lost his color no, completely. Any to kill In the film Tomahawk, boy. Jack Oakey on the oh, left the plays one, huh? Jim Beckworth. He's the fellow that might have seen the spotted in Laramie, huh? I don't know, he looks so young. Montecita was just a kid when this happened. She could be wrong. It was a long journey from the deep south to the wide open territories of the free west. A treacherous path that few survived. A new and profitable occupation emerged. Slave catching. Slave catchers made big money hunting runaways. By the mid-1800s, black pain rolled across the plains, helping to settle Kansas, Oklahoma, and states west. After contributing their sweat to the development of new settlements, they were immediately forced to move further west, trying to escape restrictive black laws designed to keep them in bondage. In 1849, over 10,000 African-American families took part in the land rush. The West meant opportunities. No hardship was too great. Degradation, brutality, and ignorance were the hurdles before them. Unbelievable savagery threatened their every move. In this pre-Civil War period, the nation was a house divided. The issue of slave labor fractured the Union. With the nation poised to fight a war over the value of black blood, slaves were inching their way further westward. Playing a million to one shot at the chance of a new life free from whips and chains, a chance for peace. There were periods of sheer joy that freedom provided. But no matter how far west they ran, they were always under the threat of the man. Life on the western prairie was never free from racism or violence. took as much as $60,000 to catch a slave. Big game honey for those times. The men were more valuable. Often, a couple were forced to separate. Go! With the big price on his head, he had little chance of escaping the slave hunter's well-trained boy. No matter how far they ran, they could not run far enough. The object wasn't to kill them, but to break them. To 
off from the slave catcher won, but not always. 75,000 slaves escaped to freedom in the decade preceding the Civil War. One of the most powerful and daring slaves to make it to freedom was Mary Fields. Mary Fields, or Black Mary, was born a slave around 1832, somewhere in Tennessee. Rock hard, she was a cigar smoking, whiskey drinking, gun toting pioneer, equal to any man in the West. A runaway slave, she clawed her way from Tennessee to Cascade, Montana, where she was taken in by St. Peter's Mission. Gary Cooper, a native of nearby Helena, Montana, remembered seeing Mary Fields when he visited Cascade as a child of nine. Mary Fields was one of the most picturesque characters in the history of Montana. Mary did the freight hauling for the mission and often spent prairie nights fighting her way through storms and braving great dangers. One night when her wagon overturned, a pack of wolves attacked, but she fought them off. Mary might have lived all her days at the mission had it not been for her terrible temper and her lack of fear. She was known to bet a silver dollar that she could knock any man cold with one punch. The challengers lined up, but she never lost. The church kicked Mary out of the mission Mother Amadeus went to the government and asked that Mary be given the mail route. They gave Mary the route between Cascade and the mission. Each day she made her triumphant entry, seated on top of the mail coach, dressed in a man's hat and coat, smoking a huge cigar. For eight years she rode for the Pony Express. Mary retired at 70. The town politicians gave her special permission to drink in the saloons, an unheard of distinction for women. She opened a laundry, grew flowers, and doted over her favorite pastime, baseball. She was treated as one of Cascade's finest. I remember seeing her in Cascade. She smoked cigars until the day she died in 1914. She must have been near 81, as I figure. Three months after the end of the Civil War, Congress voted to increase the size of the U.S. Army. The 9th and 10th Cavalry and 24th and 25th Infantry were stationed in remote outposts on the western frontier. These regiments had one thing in common. They were black. The government wanted to make use of the jobless freed slaves, many who fought during the Civil War. Their job was to protect the settlers, do the work considered unfit for whites, and above all, kill Indians. Jones Morgan was born in 1882 under the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. He was 15 when he joined the 9th Cavalry. The 110-year-old Morgan sings a song from his days as a soldier. There come your home, soldier boy. There come your home, soldier boy. Mount that horse in the battlefield. 
Buffalo soldiers became their name. It was a badge of honor. The soldiers got a reputation as fierce fighters. The Indians respected these black troops who were created to destroy them. They named them after one of their most sacred symbols, the buffalo. But despite the honor, black soldiers and Indians were poised to clash. The result would spray the Western Plains with blood. America's economy was expanding and would not be denied. Cattle needed to be moved through the Western territories to markets in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Montana. Railroads pushed through Indian territory. Progress carried a human price. Indians felt the pressure of the white juggernaut moving westward. The Native American place in the West was history. The Indians struggled to hold on to their past. The emancipation drugged black population chose to go American. They wanted in on the future. A new sense of patriotism invigorated African Americans. After more than two centuries of friendship, black soldiers chose to cut the hearts out of their former allies. They hold the dubious honor of helping to capture the great Native American chief, Geronimo. The West meant opportunities. Between 1870 and 1910, the number of African Americans nearly doubled in the West. Runaway slaves contributed to the development of the frontier. They became shop owners, hotel keepers, laundresses, miners, teachers, and politicians. Homesteaders established black towns like Boley, Oklahoma, African-American women provided the backbone of the black settlement structure throughout the West. Black pioneer women were a hardy breed. They had to tame the wild in nature and man. Though history has neglected their presence, they made their mark on the frontier. Western black women ran hotels, hairdressing parlors, restaurants, boarding houses. Black women built Western churches. They boasted a literacy rate of 74% that surpassed that of white pioneer women. This was due largely to their deep religious convictions which made learning to read the Bible an obsession. Another of black women's major contributions to the West is they birthed a lot of cowboys. You had all the black slaves and they had all this, the cattle men had all this money and they had cattle. But then somebody had to do the cattle work and none of them wanted to do it. So what happened? They decide that they will have the black slaves do the cattle work. They said, okay, we have to go give these boys that job. But there was something. Sometimes they needed the boy in the kitchen. And because he wasn't a man, they said, bring the kitchen boy over here. The boy that worked in the house, he was called the house boy. The boy that did the cow work, the rugatory, he was the cow boy. Well, you know, the cowboy was a dirty job. I mean, a lot of blacks who, uh, who was escaped and went out west and uh, 
went to towns like Bowley, Oklahoma and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you grew up with Roy Rogers and, and John Wayne, like everybody else, you know. If you didn't have it, you didn't have it. And it didn't matter what color you were. You weren't, you weren't useful. If you had it, they couldn't care less. And uh, they were great. They were just, and, and it was surprising to me because, you see, when you get to the big cities and the places that you notice where the discrimination was heavy, it's a matter of economics. And you see out there, everybody ate, everybody was well, everybody had fun, everybody breathed great air, everybody rode horses, everybody was enjoying what they're doing. And the great feasts that they had with the barbecues out there, everybody mixed together, danced and had fun. That's the way it was. With my rope and my saddle and my horse and my gun, I'm a happy cowboy If I'm riding with my cattle And I'm always on the run I'm a happy cowboy You can bet your bottom dollar That you'll never hear me holler Out the word On the range And I love to hit the leather in any kind of weather and I know I'll never change with my rope and my saddle and my horse and my gun I'm a happy cowboy and when the day is ending beneath the setting sun Happy Cowboy's work is fun. White outlaws got all the publicity. But there were some bad black men who rode roughshod over the West. Ben Hodges wasn't much for the violent side of things, but he was one of the West's slickest con men. Ben was broke, but you wouldn't know it. He rode an expensive horse, wore a beautiful set of spurs, and carried a fine gun. The town dubbed Ben's act. They listened to him spin tales as he spent their money and drank their booze. One of the more memorable cons was the big cattle ripoff. Ben brought a herd of cattle to a white rancher. They negotiated a sale. Ben would trade the cattle for six months' rent at the local hotel, a complete new outfit, a horse, and a gun. The rancher was excited. The deal was a steal. He bragged to his buddies in the saloon about the herd that he had just bought from some nigger. When asked if he had checked the brands, he admitted he had not. The rancher would soon discover that Ben had sold him his own cattle. Ben Hodges died of natural causes in 1929. He was buried in Maple Grove Cemetery, side by side with other cattlemen and cowboys, including his friend Wyatt Earp. When asked why Ben was being honored at Maple Grove, one of his pallbearers reflected fondly, we wanted Ben where we could keep an eye on him. A 21-year-old outlaw who killed 22 men might bring to mind Billy the Kid, but it could just as easily describe Cherokee Bill. Cherokee Bill, the most notorious black outlaw in American history. Born Crawford Goesby in 1876, the son of a Buffalo soldier. Cherokee Bill's life of crime began when he pumped two bullets into black Jake Lewis. Killing became fun, a charming, fun-loving psychopath bent on murder. When Cherokee would come to town, the deputy would declare him above the law. Townspeople stayed away. When the law went after him, he rode off into Indian territory where white men could not go. Women wanted him, handsome, with hair falling to his shoulders. Their beds were his for the taking, except for Maggie Glass. She set him up. 
This time, the charmer was beaten at his own game. She led Cherokee to a U.S. Marshal who rocked the unsuspecting outlaw with a blow to the head. When Bill came to, he was busted. He was brought before hanging Judge Isaac Parker. Your record is more atrocious than that of all the criminals who have hitherto stood before this bar. Death was set for March 18, 1896. According to a local newspaper, the condemned man woke up whistling. For Cherokee, death was light action. His mother walked to the gallows with him. The courtyard was jammed with people cheering for Cherokee's quick trip to hell. Mac Daddy to the end, with the noose around his neck, Cherokee was asked if he had any last words. Defiant, he played his final moments to the crowd. I came here to die, not to make a speech. After the turn of the century, the western trails dried up. The train outproduced the drovers. The Old West died a natural death. The cowboys' role changed. Many of them came off the range and entered the arena. The rodeo was born, and one of its biggest stars was Bill Pickett, known as the Dusky Demon. The question was, can you talk a little bit about Bill Pickett? Well, if I can't talk about Bill Pickett, I'll give up this here buckle that I have, and that's been winning the championship. Bill Pickett originated this event, and how he did that was he worked for the 101 Ranch, and uh, one day there was a stubborn steer out in the field, and his boss told him to go get the steer in. The steer wouldn't go in. So Bill got so mad, he jumped off his horse, and he grabbed the steer by the nose and threw the steer down on the ground. And from that day on, they called that bulldogging. He gained international fame as a rodeo performer. He discovered that a dog could render a bull helpless by biting through his lip. Only he was bold and powerful enough to pull this off. If there was any doubt that cowboys were breed apart, Bill Pickett's act put those doubts to rest. Bill Pickett was a mainstay of the 101 Ranch, which featured the best riders and ropers west of the Mississippi. He was one of the first black cowboys to star in Western movies. In 1971, Bill Pickett became the first African American to be voted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. In 1989, he was inducted into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs. A statue of the famous bulldogger was put up in Fort Worth, Texas. Bill Pickett was one of the great cowboys of all time. He worked along with other cowboys and was highly respected because of his ability to produce. And that's what cowboys look for. They don't give a damn what you look like or what your color is. All they care about is, can you produce? Are you a cowboy? Can you ride? Can you get that bull? Can you do that? And if you can do that, you're just as good as anybody else. Today's black cowboys bring their special legacy to New York City, <laughs> challenging the low self-esteem of the dispirited black ghettos. Their quiet strength provides a glimmer of hope. A blue streak of patriotism strengthens the firm grasp that black cowboys have on their American heritage. The spirit of black cowboys lives in all of us. They embody the characteristics that it took to build our nation. 
the centuries, they were up at dawn, work till dusk, doing the hammer and nail work on the American dream. Oh, my name's Steve Robinson. I was a kid who grew up in the city and uh, just wanted to rodeo all my life. I wanted to be a cowboy, I started off, you know. I started off with one pony and it's gotten out of hand, basically. The rodeos, when it looks good, you know, that's kind of like the showtime, but it's that time at home, you know, like last night we're practicing and the mayflies are eating us up and stuff like that. <laughs> What I try to tell my kids or the kids that I deal with is to just model yourself after people you want to be like. And it's nice to see some African Americans that you can model yourself after. Well, first of all, my name is C.R. Hall. I'm the 1980 All Around Champion in professional rodeo. I competed in all five events. And my specialty event was the bareback riding and the steer wrestling. And in 1980, I did something that no other black cowboy did in the American Rodeo Association, which is win the championship and all around, which meant I was the king of that association. You can't be faint-hearted, that's number one. I mean, you have to have a lot of guts. Uh, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be very skillful. You go to school to, to learn the technology about bulldog and steers, roping calves. It takes a lot of practice. Cowboys really don't come in colors. I mean, they got, you know, it's not, you know, your, uh, where you live, it's where your heart is. And, you know, be a cowboy, it takes a lot of work. I mean, you can't get kids to do this. It's so tough. I mean, it's a seven day a week job, feeding horses twice a day, cleaning out stalls, traveling all over the country, you no know, getting no sleep. I mean, it ain't, it's not like owning a sports car. I put it like that. I think when kids look at me, they see some, me doing something so unusual that they say, well, heck, if he can do that, maybe I can be an astronaut. Maybe, I, you know, and I think that one of the biggest problems is that um, a, lot of, a lot of kids' role models, when they become black, it becomes realistic for them. I mean, I'm a fireman, and I've, I've been a fireman for 16 years, and so when kids first saw me as a fireman, they said, hey, I could be a fireman. You know, I'm, 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 I'm an example. I'm a, I'm a model. You know, and I just happen to come in the right color for them so they can say, hey, I can do the same thing. I want you to know that Gene Autry was a cowboy before he got into movies. He was not made a cowboy in Hollywood. And Roy Rogers was a cowboy before he got into movies. He wasn't a guy they picked out of a drugstore. And let me tell you something about Herb Jeffries. He was on a farm when he was seven years old back in Michigan riding horses. So I was a cowboy all my life, wanting to be a cowboy, and I became a movie cowboy. That didn't change anything in my heart, and I'm still a cowboy at 82 years old. <laughs> when you ride horse like we ride them, you're physically fit all over. You are. <laughs> when you get up on this horse, when you approach this horse, what you have to do, there's a fear for the first time. You have to overcome fear. Second, you got to get confidence. Third, you got your foot in the stirrup, you get over on this horse. When you get up there, you have a posture, a posture, physical fitness. You gotta have discipline. You gotta groom and gear and clean. You gotta know that on the face, you gotta use a side brush because the hard brush will bruise his face. That's gearing, that's affection. You learn that. Cowboys might be rough, but I tell you, they're affectionate too. Ask the woman, ask the cowgirls. Cowboy. 
You can bet your bottom dollar that you'll never hear me holler about the work on the range. And I love to hit the leather in any kind of weather. And I know I'll never change with my rope and my saddle and my horse and my gun. I'm a happy cowboy And when the day is ending Beneath the setting sun A happy cowboy's word Is gone beginnings, old traditions, men and women in pursuit of new lives, searching for sex, love, and romance to make those new lives complete. We wanted to have a western wedding because uh, that's the way we live and we just wanted to be traditional with how things have always been. What I like best about Corey is that he doesn't take anything for granted, especially the land and the cattle and what people are losing every day. Things I like best about Jennifer, her spunkiness and her get up and go, and she's, she's willing to get in there with the best of the men and get her hands dirty and just <laughs> go to dark just like I do, and she'll stay beside me through thick and thin. Sex, love, and romance, Western style inseparable from the love of the land and the wide open spaces. In the early days, the mere mention of sex was taboo. Emotions were intensely private. Courtship was veiled and no one touched in public, much less in photographs. But as time passed and expressions of the heart became more open, a uniquely Western way of romancing emerged. It all started with the love of the 15-year-old daughter of a powerful senator and a 27-year-old penniless explorer. John Charles Fremont is the most exciting man I've ever met. Not like the boys back home in Missouri, a pathfinder, out there all alone, mapping trails for our army in the West. It's so exciting, even though father doesn't think so. Listen to me, Jesse Benton. Marry a soldier, marry poor. You are 15 and you are my daughter. I forbid it. You can do better. Much, much better. Even Father thinks there's something worth exploring out west. He's giving John money to continue his travels. But he'd never let me go. People say if God had meant for us to cross the country, he wouldn't have put the Rocky Mountains there to stop them. But John writes, The thought of penetrating this wilderness filled me with enthusiasm. I saw visions. Spreading over me a wind-whipped flag, he said. This flag was raised on the summit peak of the highest point of the Rocky Mountains. I am bringing it to you. 
Come fetch me at night when the house is dark. I will go with you. Defying her father, Jessie Benton eloped with John Charles Fremont in 1841, and so began a unique collaboration that lasted a lifetime. John told Jessie about his travels, and Jessie wrote of her husband's adventures in glowing prose. Among all the strange places, none has left so vivid an impression as the camp of this evening. The little hole through which we saw the stars, the dark pines where we slept, and the rocks lit up with the glow of our fire. The Fremont reports, as they were called, ignited the imaginations of their readers. If the Fremonts could cross the barrier of the God-made mountains, couldn't everyone? They could, and they did. They came for free land, gold for the taking, commerce and cattle and hides. Thousands headed west between 1830 and 1860. Men and women, black and white, Asian and Hispanic. They all came to remake themselves in the raw new freedom of the West. Among the first to go west were the early mountain men, trappers and traders. Mostly they encountered harsh surroundings, unfamiliar tribes, and above all, extreme isolation. Sometimes to break the monotony, they would hold dances. They would guzzle whiskey, trade insults, and then, when the music started, they'd dance. They'd take turns being the woman. Hey, it's your turn to be the woman. I was a woman last time. Yes, sir. They swung those partners round and round. Anyone lucky enough to show up with a real woman got in free. And if you brought more than one, you got paid 25 cents a head. Dancing ain't enough. And gambling and smoking tobacco don't help the loneliness. Sure, I get letters from home, but it ain't like having a woman. And the postcards help. You get to put a face on the things you're dreaming about. I got to see her face. Pretty? Pretty. In extreme isolation, views change about sex, about love. The frontiersman was lonely. The Native American woman, the only plentiful female in the territory. I know what they're saying. I could have her anyway, use her, trade with her people. Stay in her bed until the trapping's done. But that's not what I want. I love Inhulis. I want to stay with her forever. He says he is bringing the white priest to join us. It means our spirits will join and not just our bodies. They tell us it is wrong. His people, my people. But he is not like the rest. A husband for the season. Andrew Garcia will be my husband for life. Mixed marriages occurred on all levels of society. It was love at first sight for wealthy Colorado trader John Prowers and the dark-eyed Princess Amachi. With the Cheyenne, it is not your way. Our custom is to wait through a passing of all the seasons before we can declare ourselves to each other. My father will ask a bridal tribute. I am worthy of many horses, blankets, and valuable gifts. You are worthy of the moon and the stars but I will do what your custom demands. I will do as your people do, and I will learn to speak as you speak. And when the year is past, I will tell you, in your own language, of my respect, my devotion, and my love. And when the year had passed, Prowers and Amachi double-sealed their union, first with a traditional Cheyenne blessing, then a Christian ceremony. In 1864, at Sand Creek, Colorado, Amachi's people were massacred in a U.S. Army attack. During the raid, Prowers was held prisoner because it was feared he would warn the Cheyenne. So many killed. Women, children. Your family. My father is dead. Oh, Amachi.
Komachi. I'm sorry. I'm ashamed. How can you bear to be with me? No, my husband. I cannot bear to be without you. The soldiers who killed my people speak your language. But you... You speak the language of my heart. Even though the marriage of John Prowers and Imachi survived the hatred swirling around them, they were the exception. For most men, mixed marriage was not an acceptable solution. Cigarette companies played on men's loneliness, offering tobacco and girly cards together. One purchase could fill a lonely night with imagined sex and real smoke. You'd do anything to get your arms around a girl, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Women! 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 The U.S. government, in order to fill up Oregon and make it a state, became the West's largest wedding broker. See, a man alone could get a grant of 320 acres. But with a simple I do, 640 acres, if he could find a wife. Men were tired of being bachelors. Sure, they learned to cook and sew for themselves. In the more remote ranches, some of them even bunked together, and one of the pair was called the wife, no matter how tall, brawny, or bearded he was. Everyone knew the bachelor was just filling in, doing chores until a real wife came along. Men want wives, and they put up the money to get them. They're as sick of this as I am. Absolute gambler. Uh, you know. Yeah, I know, and I like it. Okay, Buck. But you and I are going to Chicago. I'll recruit the women, and you'll guide them across the country. Tired of waiting for a man to come calling? Tired of waiting for your life to begin? Take matters into your own hands. I am offering every young woman with a bit of gumption the chance of a lifetime. Join Asa Mercer and his Mercy Bells. Sail with me for a small fee around Cape Horn. Only women under the age of 26 need apply. Can any of you handle a gun? I mean, shoot it and hit what you're shooting at. that what you meant? There are 650 of us scheduled to go. We're not all of us just looking for a shiny gold wedding ring. Mr. Mercer says they need teachers out there too. It seems like out west, maybe you can get to do what you want, not just what you're told. He'll get us there safely. For a woman alone, it's the only way. You really think you'll find 150 women who'll come across hell to marry a bunch like that? You saw the look on their faces. You think these good men will marry those good women once they get here? Yes. That Mercer fellow's asking a lot of money for those women. But, hell, don't the Bible say it's better to marry than to burn? You hear what they're calling us? A cargo of heifers. I'm not going. The damn press has done me in. They're calling me a flesh peddler. I got 550 cancellations. Well, never mind. I'll set sail with the hundred ladies I got. It was a grand trip. Locked on a boat for 17 weeks with no one watching but the crew and each other. It was fun and it was free-spirited and they hoped it was a rehearsal for their new lives. The only thing missing was the tall, dark, handsome man they were bound to meet at the journey's end. When they got to Seattle, they all got hitched, even Mercer. You look tall in your picture. Don't worry, I'm tall enough. Mercer's bells were just a drop in the bucket. Out west, there were still ten men to every woman. 
Today, there are plenty of women to go around, but the wide open spaces still intervene. The publishers of Sweetheart Magazine, who call themselves Cowboy Cupid and Cupcake, bring men and women together in the West. Please find me a romantic, alive, blue jeans guy who's still interested in a physical commitment. I'm a cowboy through and through and have centered my life around ranch I'm living. not a full-fledged country girl, but not a city slicker either. If you either. want to place your bets on a nice, sincere cowboy with down-to-earth values, I might be your guy. Women have a great desire to do what happened in the early 1900s, come to the West and meet a rancher, a homesteader, and so it's an old idea that's come around again. I think women are attracted to cowboys because they live wholesome, clean lives, they're near animals, and they enjoy nature like stepping back in time. Charlie and I really believe strongly in the power of love. And we never have given up on anyone, and uh, never will. Their 20 years of matchmaking have resulted in over 800 marriages. There's nothing better than that to make a man feel agreeable. <laughs> Especially in the middle of the day. There's gold here, all right. See that nose? That's not only for snoring. That's for smelling out the gold. Yeah, there's enough of this yellow stuff in these mountains to make gold teeth for all the crocodiles in India. The gold boom of 1849 brought gold rushers racing across the country in staggering numbers. Every time someone yelled, gold! 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 New towns opened up at a feverish pace. The days is hard, but the nights is fine. Now, I come in from the creeks dog dirty, and it don't matter. The music's playing, and the girls are there. Whew, them dance hall girls is sassy. Accustomed to button up mothers, sisters, and wives, the sight of so much lace and skin was euphoric. Where the men went, working women followed, trooping into the boom towns in search of their fair share. Prostitution was the most lucrative occupation open to women on the frontier. And there are three things a man really requires. Good whiskey, a bold song, and an honest woman. Oh, any woman. <laughs> Wanna come visit, honey? First kiss is free. After a sample, men were permitted to talk, touch, and tumble for a price. Twenty dollars in gold dust bought a wife for the night. Here's your twenty dollars. Thanks. For young girls who had earned $5 a week as a dressmaker, prostitution was a financial bonanza. A school teacher earned $20 a month, and a laundress $25. A prostitute could pull in that much in a single night. New lives called for new names, such as Two-Bit Lil, Sawtooth Sally, Cockeyed Liz, and Pancake Fanny. But those were just working names, Behind the names were real women who had their own private lives. They wanted honest men, community standing, and money in the bank. Bell Crafton and Chicago Joe of Helena, Montana, turned their bedside earnings into lucrative real estate investments, contributing to the prosperity of the entire town. Julia Boulette of Virginia City, Nevada, nursed sick minors by day and retired to her regular duties at night. She won the respect of the community and an honorary spot on the fire brigade. But these fallen women seldom retained their respectable footing. Joe lost her money in the silver panic. Belle drank herself to death, and despite her kindness, Julia was murdered by a burglar who entered her room and smothered her with a pillow. Today, there are few legal brothels in the West, and most are run by men. But there are still pragmatic madams plying their trade in a booming business. I'm Shauna Andrews, and I'm the madam of the Hacienda in Wells, Nevada, and I'm sitting in the VIP room. This is the room where gentlemen are entertained. There's a hot tub, there's a television in case you'd like to watch something that you wouldn't normally watch on television with the children up, and you can do anything you'd like to do in here. Today, the business of, of prostitution does connect with the Old West because basically it still takes the same ingredient. 
ladies. I feel very much uh, connected to history because this business is the oldest profession in the world. So it's come along with, with all kinds of heritage. When there was three women and 50 men, or 500 men, in the state of Nevada, of course it wasn't a state, those women provided a service for all those men. It's the same service today. Uh, Ninety percent of our business is usually truck drivers. They come from all over the United States. And we have a CB radio that we talk with them and, and bring them on in. So it's kind of like advertising over the airways. Let's see, we have um, short and sassy. We have Spanish eyes. The Italian Stallion, which is really a Philly in heat. Um, Venus, the love goddess. My handle on the CB radio is ever ready. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, there ain't nothing like the ladies. Ain't they nimble? Ain't they sweet? <laughs> The young and the spry found lovers to finance them, but as they aged, they slipped back into the squalor of the houses. Later, they ended up even further down the ladder in the rickety cribs of the red light districts. The term red light was coined when the railroad workers left brakeman's lanterns outside whorehouse doors as a sort of busy signal. Even those prostitutes who managed to hang on to some money ran up against the greatest barrier of all the cold, cruel judgment of respectable women coming from the East, bringing with them their manners and their morals. Give the gals a seat. Rest the velvet, lady. Ain't she a huckleberry? These girls red bull. It was as if they had forgotten years of looking the other way. Prostitution, after all, had been society's answer to men's supposed needs. It was called the volcano theory, Men needed sex on a regular basis, like exercise, or they would erupt. They can't do that with decent women like us. That's why they needed whores. Whether they believed in the volcano theory or not, medical ignorance affected all women. Syphilis and gonorrhea were rampant, and inevitably spread outside the community of sex for hire. Still, no one would dream of talking publicly about hygiene or contraception, and there was no real vocabulary for female complaints. Sometimes dolls were used to point out to the doctor what hurt and where it was. A language of codes prevailed. Potions marked, do not take if pregnant, meant swallow if you wish to miscarry. For prostitutes who could not afford to lose months of income, preventing pregnancy was an overriding concern. Hit and miss contraceptive methods included condoms and vaginal tents of eel skin. Another device was an opium coated cervical cap because opium was a natural spermicide. It often leaked, causing a kind of euphoria. Native Americans rarely had more children than the tribe could care for. It was said that they used tree bark and moss as a primitive barrier. In whispers, women must have learned from each other. Civilizing women who came west expecting to find things more primitive, perhaps, but pretty much the way they were at home, were in for a rude surprise. I sews my own buttons, I cleans my own house, and I keeps my own counsel. Don't see no reason to change. And I sure ain't gonna wipe the gravy off my face with a hanky that I got to wash after. A slab of bread will do the job just as good, and you get to eat it, too. Good? Good. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach was never truer than on the frontier. A modest woman would never talk openly to a man about love. It wasn't proper. But she could show him how she felt when she cooked for him. Where there was food, romance blossomed, and the competition was fierce. Pioneer women eyed the rise in each other's pies and the whiteness of each other's pinafores with envy. 
At Pie Socials, a woman's pastry skill and sex appeal hung deliciously in balance. Med made their intentions public, bidding for the pies and the affections of the woman they liked best. A woman with a layer cake light as a feather could drive up the price. Of course, she could raffle off shoe leather flapjacks if she was a real looker. Different foods and their ingredients sent specific messages. Ginger was considered the spice of love because it made people feel warm. It made them perspire. It made them feel happy. And this pie is delicious, kind of tangy. <laughs> There's ginger in the apples. Would you like another piece? You bet I would. And I could stay here all night eating your apple pie. For lovers, secret messages and double entendres abounded. Stamps upside down on a letter meant, I love you, assuming that affections had not changed by the time the mail arrived. If it all got too complicated, there was always dancing. Dancing offered men a free, non-obligatory opportunity to actually touch a woman. For a woman, it meant getting a good look, up close and up and down, before deciding if this one was for better or for worse. These days, all over the country, men and women take off their business clothes, put on their cowboy boots, and two-step the night away. to a fenced range. Do you always try to climb over? I always see if the gate's open first. But one way or another, though, you try. There's not a lot sexier than the image of a lone cowboy sitting tall in his saddle, even if he's gazing at an empty horizon instead of into your eyes. If the strong, silent type turns you on, you'd be hard-pressed to find a man stronger or more silent than the cowboy. He drifted up and down the cattle frontier like tumbleweed. At the end of the cattle drive, he'd polish his boots, curl his mustache, and gallop into town on the prowl for a woman. The closest a cowboy came to marrying was a mock wedding, a short-term fling complete with tin wedding band. And after a while, he tipped his hat, got on his horse, and, sunset or not, rode away west. Cheyenne, Cheyenne, hop on my pony. There's room here for two deer, but after the ceremony. A cowboy's dream is a simple thing, just a life that's free on the lone prairie. Horses and cattle, it's a great old battle in the open land of the West Country. I'm a cowboy, a cowboy, a cowboy all my life. I'm a cowboy, a cowboy, a cowboy till I die. Wild West shows and rodeos have turned cowboys' straightforward tasks into glamorous routines. Today, rodeos are the sport of the West. Thousands come to cheer, and the most popular riders, the really big stars, are the men who ride the bulls. And the coveted prize? A big, shiny belt buckle. I told him I wanted a buckle, so I went and visited him uh, in halls with him over the fourth. He told me I earned my buckle, and he said I could pack out, pick out anyone I wanted. So I got this one. It says, uh, 
Mountain State Circuit Final bull riding. And I had to give it, have it because it had the rubies in it. When you get a belt buckle like this, it gives you a needs or something going on. <laughs> On the frontier, women had no choice but to wait for their cowboys to blow into town. Angle, what'd you do with the jewelry case? I need some earrings. In today's West, there are women who will follow those cowboys wherever they go. We could go to at least one rodeo for sure, or two rodeos a month. It's perfume and I'm ready to go. There's like 12 of us here, 12 girls. And it's one of the few times that we can get everybody together while on vacation, we're here to have a good time. Our group just keeps growing as we go to different rodeos. We pay our own way. One of us is short one month, we pitch in, you know, that's, that's how it is. It's kind of like a family. There's the cowboys. When you first get here at the, at the beginning of the rodeo, and you, uh, you get to the rodeo, then you come back here to behind the shoes to see who's riding, see who's up, see who's uh, see who you go dancing with that night. That's how you, you look them up. A lot of them are just very good friends. We love to be around them. We love to sit around and visit with them, laugh and joke, go out and eat or go have a drink and go dancing. They treat you like ladies, they're nice to you, they visit with you. They're a lot of fun. Most of the cowboys that I know are immaculate. They have starch shirts, starch jeans. They wear their Wranglers in a way that fits so nice. They're all athletically fit. Yeah. Because they have to be to sport their Their physique, they're, look at them. I mean, look at them. They're athletes. They're athletes. They've got hard bodies. <laughs> they're probably in better physical shape than most football players. Well, I think what the guys think buckle bunnies are, are like a rock and roll groupies, the girls that hang out at the back door waiting to uh, go with the star or the singers or the band or whatever. We're not buckle bunnies in the sense that we don't wait for anybody. We're not there to see if we can get a buckle or see if we can score or whatever they, what do you want to say? We're there because we enjoy them, we enjoy being with them, we enjoy visiting with them. And if we fall in love with one of them, we fall in love with one of them. What do you see when you look straight at me? Do you look in my eyes and see, cowboy? Take off my hat and my boots and my chaps. And what do you have still, cowboy? Just a cowboy, a cowboy, a cowboy all my life. I'm a cowboy, a cowboy, a cowboy till I die. somebody here that I uh, I kind of like. He uh, he rides bulls and he's uh, he's just wonderful. But uh, if things work out, they work out, and if they don't, they don't. But you just have to trust, and you see them when you can, and you visit. And if they call, they call, and if they don't, they don't. The way I don't get hurt is I I just know that uh, I just take things one day at a time. Mom told me one day she said. Lisa, I wish you'd stay away from those cowboys and those baseball players. One of these days, I'll take her advice. <laughs> Ah, uh, you four-flushing mule, you ain't wiping it off, you're rubbing it in. There were some women in the West who had no interest in waiting for a cowboy. Cowgirls were tough bachelor bells who intended to live by their wits and call their own shots. They dressed like men, rode like men, drank like men, and swore like men. And they were popular stars of the Wild West shows. They weren't the type to drop their handkerchiefs to get a man's attention. No, sir. If they saw what they wanted, they just roped it in. <laughs> Tip your hat when you speak to a lady. I will when I speak to a lady. Oh, 
Bill. Like cowboys, cowgirls had glamour. According to the movies, the notorious Calamity Jane was a charming, sexy woman. The real Jane was neither. She was a wagon master who drove her mules and her men at a frantic pace. They said she married 12 men, 11 of whom met violent deaths within a week of the wedding. Get in my way, expect a calamity. That's what they used to say. My name be Marcy Jane Canary. So I expect you folks might know me a little bit better by a name that I gained through my adventures in the West. And that be Calamity Jane. Now some folks behind my back have been brazen enough to say that I have the figure of a busted bale of hay. But Cupid's arrow did pierce my heart once. And I'm gonna tell you Calamity Jane's love story. My name is Norma Slack. I'm the great, great niece of that rather notorious woman of the West, Calamity Jane. I believe that Calamity Jane is a modern woman long before her time. I myself have lived a life quite a bit that way, and so it's good for me to be able to get up in front of folks and first of all, portray her in a family manner so I don't have to worry about her whiskey drink and tobacco chewing and foul mouth, but tell about the good side of her, for Calamity Jane is a Western legend. And what I do out here is not claim to have the truth, but claim to have a representation of what she might have been like. Now early in my life I'd made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to give my heart to any gent for I cherished my freedom. But at the sight of that one, my old heart was going pitter-pat in my chest. For he was none other than the notorious Wild Bill Hickok. Calamity Jane herself had been hanging out with all these beaver skinners and uh, people who prospected for gold, and they weren't very clean. And here was this fellow just decked out to the hilt, and she saw this new Western legend, and she fell in love with that. It's 110 years later, and scholars are still asking, were Wild Bill and Calamity Jane married? Were they lovers? Did they even know each other? Or is it all made up? What about Wild Bill? Was he an upstanding lawman or a low-life gambler? And if he was as handsome as they say, would he have fallen in love with the raunchy Calamity Jane? The truth didn't matter. Wild Bill was the model for heroes of pulp fiction like Deadwood Dick. And in those books, his constant sweetheart was Calamity Jane. Dime novels were like the National Enquirer of the Old West. They sold thousands of copies. And people then, like people today, believe what they want to believe. I believe they met each other and fell in love and had an entanglement, possibly even had a child, that Bill could never come forth and tell the public that he was married to her because of the way she was and because he was trying to climb a social ladder in the West, believe it or not. The only fact we really have is that when Wild Bill Hickok died in 1876 in a Deadwood, South Dakota saloon, he was married to the equestrian, Agnes Thatcher. That didn't stop Calamity Jane from publicly mourning Bill for the rest of her life. Was it love or just good publicity? If you take a trip over to South Dakota, while you look up Mount Moriah Cemetery. Now you will find the tombstone of William Butler Hickok. But there by its side you will find the tombstone of Martha Jane Canary Burke. For you see old Calamity Jane got her final wish. That was to be buried next and beside her friend and love, Wild Bill Hickok. She's my relative, and so I guess when I stand in front of folks and tell her stories, I guess a part of me wants them to listen to the part of her that was good. I guess I feel, even though I'm not a Western legend, that some of my own wanting to be accepted for what I am comes out in my stories of calamity. The West has always been a place where the rugged individual could feel at home. No one proved that more than a certain Mrs. Noonan. She worked as a laundress for General Custer's 7th Cavalry and married three of his soldiers. As a midwife, she delivered every baby at the fort. But when they asked her why she had no children of her own, Mrs. Noonan replied, it is not given to us all to be mothers. Especially not Mrs. Noonan. 
She died of pneumonia while her husband was away on patrol, and when they laid her out, it was discovered that she was a he. With the rapid expansion of the railroads, east and west were beginning to meet, and the territories were ripe for new ventures. What do we need out west? I'll tell you what we need. We need women and good restaurants. The enterprising Fred Harvey began a chain of first-class meal and rest stops along the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. He figured he couldn't lose with a combination of rapid transportation, decent food, and a little discreet sex appeal. I'll have your steak for you in a minute, sir. Hey, what you do that for? I weren't finished. It's on account of your manners. In a place like this, you don't blow on your soup. You fan it with your hat. Oh. Wholesome food and wholesome health. That's my motto. The Harvey girls are respectable waitresses. And it don't hurt that they're pretty, too. I have viewed the noblest shrines in Italy and gazed upon the richest mosques in Turkey. But the fairest of all the sights, it seems to me, was the Harvey girl I saw in Albuquerque. A Harvey girl is more than a waitress. Wherever a Harvey house appears, civilization is not far behind. You girls are the symbol and the promise of the order that is to come. Perfection in the dining room, perfection in the dorm. We even want perfection in the Harvey uniform. Stout black shoes to keep a sense of humor. Please confine your underwear to camisole and rumor. Black shirt waist, cuffs neat and trim. The apron must be spotless from the collar to the hem. The apron must be spotless and must have the proper swirl. That's the first requirement of a Harvey girl. I give my girls room, board, a return ticket, and $210 a year, not counting tips. But I make them sign a contract saying they won't get married for a year or they forfeit their salary and ticket. Otherwise, I lose them too fast. Too many anxious bachelors courting over coffee and proposing over pancakes. The people gotta eat! Just the same, by the end of the year, most Harvey girls had found a husband and torn up their contracts. At the same time that Harvey houses were dotting the western landscape, rowdy bordellos and hurdy-gurdy bars were losing business, and a steady stream of respectable women began to arrive. They were not prepared for the constant exposure to the sexual freedom of the harlots and dance hall girls. The new society demanded that gamblers, faro dealers, hustlers, and whores move out of the main streets and into strictly defined districts. Sex which had flourished out in the open became hidden and in some cases illegal. The civilizing of the West had begun. Like the cowboys and showgirls who had come before, these new settlers were also drawn by the West's freedom. They were pioneers too, just as spirited and courageous. And there were those who wanted to bring the East with them and just as many who came with the express purpose of leaving it behind. But the West had its own agenda. Everyone had to change and learn to accommodate what they wanted with what they found. It's a hard life, and we spend our days working in the fields alongside our men. But it still feels like it's a more free life. Someone isn't always watching, telling you what you do is wrong. And come Saturday night, if you rub a little rouge on your lips, some buttermilk on your cheeks and dust a little flour over it, you don't look like you've been out working in the sun all day. Women, who once only worried about being ladylike, began to wonder instead, what does a lady like? Which of the boys slept in this bed, do you suppose? <gasps> Dorcas Galen! What's the matter? Didn't you ever think of that? You're sleeping in one of their beds? <gasps> Mail-order catalogs brought pictures of what they were wearing in New York and Paris. And pretty soon, the dusty streets of the West were blooming with the same colors and fashions that were being paraded down Fifth Avenue. For a woman, getting ready for her man was no easy chore. Her layers were like her armor, and they had to be removed before she could surrender. Bodice and skirt. 
cotton petticoat trimmed in lace. Bustle filled with horsehair. Double boned corset. High laced shoes. Ribbed stockings. <laughs> but not the chemise or bloomers. I leave those for him. Howdy, ma'am. Sorry I'm late. From the beginning, the search for sex, love, and romance in the West has always had its own special character. Isn't this wonderful? What's that over there? Blue Mesa. Can't we go there? Well, it's not as close as it appears, Miss Thursday. Maybe it has to do with the love of the land, the animals, the wide open spaces that put distances between people who want to be close. Maybe it has to do with the frontier, any frontier from the west to the moon. There's always going to be something you haven't seen just over the next hill. Just let me live my life as I have begun and give me work that's open to the sky. Make me as big and open as the plains, as honest as the horse between my knees, clean as the wind that blows behind the reins, free as the hawk that circles down the breeze and guide me on the long, dim trail ahead that stretches upward toward the Great Divide. Well, the cowboy prayer to me has always been just, I almost feel just exactly like he's saying mm -hmm. because that's the only way we know how to live. Corey, you may kiss the bride. It is my happy pleasure and privilege to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Corey Everett. Yeah, we feel connected to the Old West through basically our roots, how we grew up. We still do things the way they do back in the old days. We still ride and we still gather cattle. So it's still the West out here. I feel like this is God's country, you know, this is where he ended and this was his best effort. We just get to enjoy it every day and kind of have our freedom, so to speak. It's the myth of the frontier. Men and women struggling together to tame the land and their passions. To carve out of the rugged wilderness a peaceful home and out of the tangled spirit a happy heart. <laughs>